Okay, let's start. Um, so today we'll finally be talking about entanglement in the ground state of local Hamiltonians. We'll use what we've learned from free fermions to draw some general conclusions. Um, and so I will be quoting a number of facts, some of which you have to believe, some of which you'll test in the tutorial today. But you have all the tools available with what we've learned um, about Julia to actually test everything I'll, I'll say today. Very good. So we want to talk about the scaling of entanglement in ground states. Um, we start with these free fermions. And first, I want to consider one-dimensional systems um, with a Hamiltonian H with energy gap. Okay, so we define the energy gap as the difference of energy between the first excited state and the ground state. Okay. And we actually define this in the limit of a very large system. So if you may see that for a finite system, you have a gap, right? This, this is positive. This is some finite number. But as you increase the system size, this gap may close. Now we are interested in the case where in the thermodynamic limit, so in the limit of an infinite system, we still have a finite gap, OK? And in that case, we can draw the dispersion relation, I'll do this here. So let me draw energy as a function of k, momentum. This is k. And what we're talking about is the case where in the continuum you have a continuum. Uh, in the thermodynamic limit, you have a continuum of momenta. And we still have some finite gap here. This is our delta E larger than 0. And examples of this could be. Uh, the Ising model that you dealt with, or the Majorana model that you dealt with, with an H, which is, there was this parameter H in the Hamiltonian, which is going to be, say, for instance, 1.1, 1 .1, uh, or different from the critical value, which is 1. Okay? So you can go and test whatever I, I will say next. Actually, you will have, you'll see it in the tutorial today. So once we have such a Hamiltonian with this gap, we can ask a number of questions for the ground state. Now I'm going to talk about the ground state. I'm going to plot two different things for the ground state. First, I want to talk about correlations. And then I want to talk about entanglement entropy. OK. As a function of, I'm going to plot this as a function of the logarithm of L. So what I'm thinking here is that we already take N, the system size, to infinite. And L is size of region A. Right? We have, we divide our system into two pieces, A and the rest, and we trace out the rest. And we can ask, questions about the region A, or in the case of correlators, simply how much is a correlator from one point to a point which is L size of one. OK, so if I have a gap system, then what you can see is let me plot here log of 
a correlator. So this is a log log plot. And for correlations here, directly you could take a C of this correlator. It could be something as simple as um, you take your correlation matrix uh, on, on with the index indices um, M and M plus L. This would be something that would give you correlations in the system. Okay, you take this correlation matrix, you ask how an, um, a mode, so th this is about the expectation value, say, or it's related to the expectation value of, say, psi M1, psi M plus L2. Let's, let's take this one, right? So we can plot this as a function of L. The system is translation invariant, so M does not enter. In this, this does not depend on M, it only depends on L. Um, and what you will see is actually something like this. You will see a behavior that looks like that. Okay, so what we see here is, this is a log log plot. <coughs> what we see, what we're gonna focus on is this part here, which actually says that this correlator, C of L, goes ex asymptotically for large distances as it decays exponentially with L, okay? So if we have a gap system, correlations decay exponential. We have an exponential decay of correlations. Um, and then this will happen, so we have, we see first some other behavior, but then it tends to this exponential decay. And then, and then this occurs, roughly speaking, around the what is called the correlation length. So there is, there is a quantity, she, which is the correlation length. This is a length scale after which you see that things are, that the correlations decay exponentially, and with the correlation length also appears in, in, in this exponential decay. Very good, so that's um, what we see when we look at two-point correlators, you can test this. And if we look at entanglement entropy, what we observe, so now I'm gonna plot entanglement entropy here, what we observe is um, S of L. We observe uh, some behavior that looks like this. First, we have a logarithmic scaling, and at some point, it saturates to a constant. Okay? So, and I'm gonna focus, so what we say is that the entropy goes to a constant. Okay, so this is a gap system, and uh, there is, again, some place where this happens, roughly speaking, and this would be, again, when L is on the order of the correlation length in the system, okay? Good, so these are statements that you can check. Uh, what I want to, but the point is that we are testing this for free fermions, but this is a very general statement that we observe in one dimensional systems when we have a gap in the Hamiltonian. Now, we could also t test what happens in gapless systems. So let me consider now gap, uh, a gapless Hamiltonian, gapless H. So what we're saying here is that instead now the dispersion relation decides that there is no gap, okay? There are zero modes in the thermodynamic limit. And and then for this case, so examples, this would be again Ising model. Examples that you've been playing with or Majorana model that you would consider, which were dual. And that would be for H equal to H critical, which is one. And if we try, if we plot again the same properties here, if we look at correlations, or if we look at the scaling of entanglement entropy, what we'll see this time is a power law all the way, so we'll see that the correlations this time obey power law, okay, decay as some power of the distance, and the entanglement entropy will follow a logarithmic scaling uh, at all distances. Okay, and obviously you can understand this second case 
as what happens in the first case in the limit where the correlation length goes to infinite. So what we are saying is that there was some initial behavior which happened to be approximately logarithmic, which was corrected into a constant at the correlation length. But if we, push, if we keep pushing the correlation length away, larger and larger, we'll end up with just having this pure behavior. Okay, so these are two parts of the same picture. Very good. So um, what else can we say? OK, so it turns out that we've been looking at other models. So let me consider another gapless model. Um, and in that case, and this could be the XX model that you have also been studying, or uh, the fermionic, the model with fermionic, quadratic and fermionic operators that we've been looking at, which again are dual through Jordan Wigner transformation. And what we see in this case is that, uh, I don't know if you remember, there was some dispersion relation, it looked like that, but once you decide um, to take, to change the sign of these particles. So this, this, these, are, these states are occupied in the ground state, so let's decide, let's change to antiparticles, and what we see is that the dispersion relation ends up looking like this. I just took these negative energies and made them positive, since these states are gonna be occupied anyway. And so we see the dispersion relation has this form now. Um, and what, and then if we plot again correlations and entropy, what we see is, again, um, some power law. So this is correlations decay as one over L with some new power prime. And the entropy, so log L, log L, log of the correlator, entropy, and the entropy follows again a logarithmic behavior, okay? But if we compare the entropy that we have here and the entropy that we have here, if we look carefully, what we see is that this entropy is actually not just some logarithm, it's one over three log two of L, whereas here if we look closely we see one over six log two L. Okay, so what we start to see, what we start to see is that um, there is some very concrete number that appears in front of the logarithms, um, and actually what you could do, you can really do this if you want, is to play around with this fermionic model. You can add next to nearest neighbor hopping. So I did this yesterday. And what you get is a new dispersion relation that looks like this. So this is the fermionic model. Okay, plus next to nearest neighbor hopping. Okay, and you get the dispersion relation like that instead. Um, and if you plot, again, you get the power law here. And if you look at what you get here, well, again, you get, for the entropy, a logarithmic behavior, but now it's gonna be 2 thirds of log 12, okay? And if you look at this, there is a pattern here for the critical uh, systems, which is um, count, so number of zero modes, okay? We, need, we see how many times, for how many values of k, of the momentum k, we get energy equal to zero, okay? What we see is that there is a relation between the entropy in critical systems, which uh, scales like this. So we have one over six log to L, and here we put directly this number of zero modes, okay? So this is interesting because the entropy is a property of the ground state, okay? You are only given the ground state, you can compute the entropy from it. You don't need to know the Hamiltonian. It's just a property of the ground state. But the ground state kind of knows how many 
Zero modes are there in the Hamiltonian. Zero modes is a property of the Hamiltonian. Okay? It's a relation between energies of the ground state and other states. Okay? But the ground state somehow knows how many zero modes are there in the Hamiltonian. Okay? And the expression here in general, this was, um, we have this expression, but actually the, the, the one that is valid also not just for free fermions, but in general, is that there is a central charge of the theory divided by log 2. Uh, divide by 6 times log 12, okay? Okay, so what we're seeing here is the first example where, where we look at entanglement, okay? We, we've computed the ground state, we analyze how entanglement scales, and we learn something about, say, the universality class of the phase transition. We are learning just by about, we're extracting universal properties of the system just by looking at how entanglement scales. And that's something that we'll see happening over and over. C over 6 or C over 3? It's C over 3, thanks. Yes. And then what we had is that for the IZ model, C was 1 half. And for the XX model, C was 1. Indeed. Thank you. Yes. Very good. Sorry. How do you count the number of zero modes from the root question? I just look at how many <laughs> times the this curve. One, two, three, four. So after that, if you know. Oh, uh, yeah, no, we only go all the way to pi, right? Very good. OK. So then the first conclusion is that we will be able to extract information by looking at important information, universal properties of the system by looking at entanglement. And we'll see this happening many times. But the other observation, maybe the most important, the more important one for next week, um, is that we want to compare with what happens with a random state. Um, by random state, I mean we pick up two to the n, two to the n coefficients here. Right, we, we can pick up two to the n random coefficients. And this ended up being a optional problem in the tutorial two days ago, I believe. Comparing the scaling of entanglement with a random state. Okay. It was it wasn't there? Yeah, it was. Yeah. I, I, actually it was yeah. It was. And it was optional and I don't know how many people did it, but it's it's not very complicated and you can do that. And then if you look at the entropy, what we see in this case is Again, we take n going to infinite. Don't, don't try it with a computer. Um, and we just look at L. And we can ask how much is the scaling of the entropy as a function of L. And what we see is that for, well, the first thing is to remember that there is an upper bound okay, that says that the entropy of L qubits is at most L. Okay, we, we saw that the other day. And so if we now take this random state made of random coefficients and we plot it here, what we see is basically something that is very, very close to this bound. Okay, so I'm going to call this um, S of run as a function of L. And now we go back to our discussions before, and we plot how what the scaling is for ground states, and we have two behaviors. One is logarithmic. Okay, so now I'm plotting this in linear axis, so the log is going to look like a log. So I'm going to say it goes like this. Okay, and I'm being generous. And we also have 
um, other, another behavior, which is a constant, which basically consists in you start with logarithmic, and at some point you get tired, and now you are constant. Okay. okay. And these are ground states. of local Hamiltonians. OK, so really the big, the, the important conclusion here, uh, much more important whether, than whether we can extract a central charge or not, is that ground states of local Hamiltonians are not very entangled. Okay, and this is really the most important conclusion of maybe the whole course. Yes? Uh, is there a, a, an analytic theorem or something which says this, or is this just an observation? This is an observation based on, well, it's not an observation by one person, it's yes. lots of observations <laughs> coinciding in, in this statement. Yeah. And we'll, now we're going to be more precise about how exactly it scales in general and so on. But there, there are no, there, are, there might be some theorems um, supporting partially some of the results <coughs> about scaling. But usually the theorems are way behind. They prove some, some, you know, maybe that the entropy cannot be linear, right? But we know there is plenty of evidence that this is at most logarithmic. Or maybe there is a theorem that shows that it, it can at most be logarithmic but with a huge constant here, which has nothing to do with what we observe, okay? So there might be some theorems, but most of the, but when we want to know how it scales, we really look at examples and accumul accumulation of examples. Okay, so why is this important? Well, let, let me try to understand possible computational computational implications. Okay, so what we could have is a product. Let's look at the product state again. Um, of n qubits. Okay, and what we have in this case is psi 1, phi 2, phi n. And I can ask how much is the entropy here as a function of, you know, if I just take L of them, right? And I look at, I trace out the rest, I still have a pure state for the L spin. So the entropy here is zero, okay? S of L equal to zero, okay? And on the other hand, if I, if I want to see how many coefficients I need to, to, to write this state, I realize I need a couple of coefficients to specify the state of the first spin, a couple of coefficients to specify the state of the second spin, and so on, okay? So two coefficients per spin, so uh, say memory or number of coefficients, what I say is that it's order n. Okay, I, I'm done with order n coefficients. I have completely specified this product state. So no entanglement is good for efficiency in the description. No entanglement, efficient description. All right. Now, down here we have generic or random. I'll call it generic. Okay, I need to push this up. Generic uh, state. By generic state, I mean one chosen with random coefficients, right? I keep repeating this, this, this experiment, and I always get the curve that is hard to distinguish with the upper bound. So generic state, then we have psi equal to the sum, psi i1, i2, in. I ask how much is the entropy, and I see that it goes as L. Okay. I look at how many coefficients I need in this case, and I realize it's ordered 2 to the n. Okay. It takes 2 to the n coefficients to describe this state. And now what we're looking at here is, so we have this one, we have this one, and I want to look at ground states of local Hamiltonian. 
okay? And I still don't know how to express whatever is happening, but there is something happening because the entropy is equal to a constant or at most log L, which is much smaller than this, okay? And this, this is already kind of suggestive that we are in a situation between the generic state and the product state, okay? We are somewhere in between zero entropy and maximal entropy. And so the question, the big question that we will answer next week is what does this imply? Where are we with the complexity of the discussion? Does, does it, the fact that we have states which are very special, they have only a small amount of entanglement, does it mean that we can find a, an efficient way of describing them? Okay? And so next week we'll answer this positively, we'll say yes. And tensor neighbors will be the way of exploiting this, this very particular structure of entanglement. Okay? Very good. So, however, I've only been talking so far about uh, ground states of one dimensional systems. And now I want to extend this discussion to higher dimensions. And what we'll see there is that basically the same conclusion holds that ground states are still not very entangled. But it's worth looking also at two dimensions because we'll see, we'll start, what we want to do is, is we want to go to the same, beyond the statement they are not very entangled. We want to understand why. You want the previous board? Yeah. Which was um, this one, probably. Okay, so um, so let's look at two dimensions now. And in this case, um, what we find is that there are three different situations of interest. So again, we can have, uh, I'm gonna plot here dispersion relation, now as a function of kx and ky. And I'm gonna do this three times to discuss three different cases of interest. Okay, so um, how do I do this? Yeah. The first case is going to be, again, a gap. Hamiltonian. So we'll see that there is a, disp a typical dispersion relation will look like this. Okay? So you have um, that there is, again, a finite gap here. Between the zero energy that would be here and the first uh, excitation. Okay? We could have gapless Hamiltonian, which I'm going to call of type one, where now this dispersion relation went down. And so the gap is zero. Okay? That's also going to be an interesting case. Um, but in two dimensions, we can have what I'm going to call gapless two situation, where actually, what happens is that there is a continuum of zero modes, okay? So you could imagine the dispersion relation was going like this, and then after changing particles into antiparticles, uh, anti we get a dispersion relation like this, where now there is the gap is again zero, but there are many different momenta for which we have zero energy, whereas here we just had one. Okay, so let's look at that in more detail, what happens Let's look at what happens in these cases. So it turns out, and again, this is an exercise that you can do, that if we focus on the entropy, the function of L, S of L, so what we're thinking now here is we are in real space, we have such a system, this is square lattice, say. Okay, again, N went to infinite, so this is an infinite lattice, but now we look at a region, a region, in here, of linear size L, okay? So region A is made of L times L sites, okay? And we ask how much entropy, how, what's the entropy of row A? How much entropy do we have in the density matrix describing the region, okay? 
In other words, how much entanglement do we have between A, the region A, and the rest of the system? And if we ask this question, uh, if we compute the answer to this question by getting the ground state, computing the reduced density metrics on the region, and then computing the entropy, what we see is that the entropy now is proportional to L. Okay? And, but how, so, so what would be S uh, if we try this, uh, what's the upper bound for S of L? Okay? So what's the upper bound in this case that we could have? How much entropy could we have in the region A as a function of L? How, how many sides do we have in L, in, in region A, sorry? We have L square sides, so the end, the, what we're looking here is that the upper bound is L square. When we look at the ground state, instead of L square, we get L, okay? So again, we are in a situation where we have, we don't have a lot of entanglement compared to how much we could have. Okay, very good. So what happens if we have, what happens if we have um, not a gap system, but a gapless system? So remember this time, now we have the, the correlation length went to infinite and all these things. We look at the entropy, this would be the behavior, well, the, the, the SL that we have for the gap system. And does anybody want to venture how this is going to behave? Logarithmic correction, maybe. Well, one could think that maybe there will be a logarithmic correction, but actually, the entropy scales again proportional to L. Okay? So, in Gabler's case, where we have, uh, say, this would be a direct point. Or more generally, what we want to ask is how many, so we, we could imagine that we have a finite number of zero modes. Okay, so we could imagine a situation where the dispersion relation is more complicated and there are a finite number of, of zero modes. Here there is only one, but we could have more, okay? Or as long as this is finite, we find this, this scaling as in the gap case. And when we go to gap, Plus the case gap plus two, that's where we actually see that the entropy this time goes uh, as L log L. Okay? This requires um, uh, a Fermi surface or a 1D, um, how do I want to call this? A 1D Fermi surface, 1D surface, which amounts to infinitely many zero, zero modes. Okay? So again, what we see is that we're, we're talking about the property of the ground state, but the ground state somehow knows about the full spectrum of eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. It knows how many zero modes we have. Okay? Very good. So, so then we are ready to to go to D that I mentioned in general, but I'm gonna just write the table here. So we've looked at, um, what do we wanna do? Um, Okay, so we have um, gap systems, and we have gapless systems, and then we have uh, it can be in one D, two D, three D. Okay, and then here I have to talk about two types, so type one and type two of gapless systems. And what we see is a gap system in 1D, we saw that the entropy was a constant, okay? In 2D, we've seen that the entropy goes as L. If, if you do this for 3D, you see that the entropy grows as L squared. So this is always, this is always entropy of L goes as L 
to the d minus one dimensions. Okay. So maybe I should write this d equal to one, d equal to two, d equal to three. So this is what we call the area one. Basically, in, in three dimensions, for instance, you could have, again, a cubic lattice of size infinite. And what we're asking is if we have a region of size L times L times L, so this is region A, the entropy of region A does not scale as the size of the region. Okay, The size of the region would be, so if you want S on a random state, if we had prepared a random state, of the system and we look at the entropy, this would be L to the three this time in three dimensions. And we could also think of this as being proportional to the size of the region, how many sites we have in the region. Okay? So we could call this volume law. And this would be for a generic state, random state. But for a ground state, what we see instead as ground state, what we see is that this does not go as, does not scale with the size of the region, but as the size of the boundary of the region. Okay? So this scales as the size of the boundary of the region. So this scaling with the size of the boundary is what we call the area law. Okay? Very good. And we'll try to understand uh, possible toy models that explain this area law in a minute. Very good. So that's what we have for gap systems. But we also have it here for certain um, gapless systems. And what's the, so there will be a fer Fermi surface. So I'm going to call this one. I'm going to call it small. If there is small Fermi surface, and by small, I mean of co-dimension um, not one, so sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll say that in again, so in a second. But so what we'll have here is the type one is going to be small Fermi surface, and here type two is going to be large Fermi surface. Okay, and what we see is that in the Gabbard's case, we have a logarithmic correction to a constant. Here we have um, no logarithmic correction. Okay, so if we have a small Fermi surface, in a sense that I'll specify in a second, we still have the area law. And if we have a large Fermi surface, then we have a multiplicative logarithmic correction to the area law. That's what we see in general. Okay, so what do I mean by small or large Fermi surface? Well. Um, in d dimensions, I'm going to call large, large Fermi surface uh, one that has dimension d minus one or co-dimension one. Okay, so we just look at here. We're living in two. Dim uh, we have x and y. We're in two dimensions, and we see the Fermi surface has dimension one. That's okay. It's, it's d minus one. In, in if we were in, in three dimensions, and we look at our dispersion relation, and there is a Fermi surface of dimension two, then we'll say we have a large Fermi surface. Then we'll have also this logarithmic correction. Okay. And if the Fermi surface has smaller dimension than d minus one, then we won't see the logarithmic corrections. Very good. So. We have this area law, and at most, logarithmic corrections to it in some cases. And so the statement that I'm going to make, again, there are no theorems involved in this, is that even though this analysis refer to, refer to free fermions, we see that, and, and for free fermions, you can go and test it. And I think the homework, second homework, will be about studying this in two dimensions, seeing this logarithmic correction in two dimensions. 
uh, so, so free fermions are special. We can see this explicitly for arbitrarily large systems, but we have also seen the same behavior in all types of systems, interacting systems. Okay? So we believe that's you know, theorem. No, we believe <laughs> um, that th this is general. This table applies to, and now I'm going to say all, and then I'll have to take this back to all types, to, to all systems. Okay, that if you look, if you have uh, ground states of local Hamiltonians in any dimension, they'll obey an area law or at most logarithmic corrections to the area law. And this, when I say all, then, you know, some people are into finding counterexamples. And if you are into finding counterexamples, you will find counterexamples. But you'll have to engineer your Hamiltonian really, really careful. Okay, you have to go there and, and um, yeah, make strange things happen. And this, uh, so maybe the statement is for all systems that we would consider of interest uh, before we started looking at entanglement, right? So, so if now that we're looking at entanglement, you come up with a system that is of interest because it violates the rule, that's fine. But if you would like to understand some typical condensed matter system, or in quantum field theory, we'll find similar behavior and so on, then you, 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 ca you yeah, you, you will find that there is this area law or almost a logarithmic correction. Um, so the evidence for this then comes from quantum field theory arguments of, you know, take the continuum limit of this lattice and calculations. Actually, it looks like a subfield in quantum field theory to compute entanglement entropies nowadays, um, but also from exactly solvable models. And also from numerical numerical calculations that you know, of the type that we've been doing during the first week uh, and, and the second week, okay. And in particular, this s, this logarithmic, this logarithmic correction that we see in higher dimensions, say in in d equal to two, right? We see these logarithmic corrections. Then this, of course has been seen in Fermi gas, which is this free fermion, but it also corresponds to Fermi liquid, which are effectively described by some Fermi gas, so no surprise there. But more interestingly, um, they have also be seen, been seen in systems of, of bosons, uh, what's called spin Bose metal. Okay. That's you don't need to start with fermions for the ground state to be the result of some collective um, organization of degrees of freedom, which includes something that looks like a Fermi surface. Okay? And so spin Bose metals are examples of systems that effectively have some form of Fermi surface, and then they display these logarithmic corrections as well. Okay? And as I said before, ground states are not very entangled. So next week we'll, we'll have to look, we'll go to this table and we'll try to find a tensor network description, efficient tensor network description for any ground state. Uh, for each type of scaling, we'll have a different type of tensor network. Very good. So now, what I want to do is I want to investigate you know, this. I, I listed, I made a list of, of behaviors here, right? And now we would like to start. I made a list of possible behaviors, and I explained why this might be relevant. But now I would like to start understanding why we have this behavior. And for that, I would like to understand why we have an area law. And for that, it's very useful to consider toy models. Okay? So that's what I want to do next. I want to talk about toy models for the area law so that we have an intuition of why we have it. And so for that, let me uh, denote so let me draw, or I'm going to draw stuff. So when you see this, I'm using that to denote a singlet state. Remember, this was a state which was uh, 0, 1, minus 1, 0. Okay, it's a maximal entangled state of two qubits. And, and what happened? And, and then if I, 
if I take this, this pair, so each circle denotes a spin, and if I now declare this to be region A, you know that row A is proportional to the identity, which means it has eigenvalues, the density matrix has eigenvalues one half and one half, and we already discussed that therefore the entropy in this case is equal to one, which is one EBIT, okay? Good, so now what I want to do is I want to generalize this simple setting to one where we have many such spins. And we have that they are entangled pairwise. Okay. And I would like to understand if in this case, if I decide that this is region A, if I call this four spins region A, I would like to understand how much entropy is there in row A. And for that, um, what I need to do is to realize first that row A is gonna look like, well, for, from, this, from this guy what we get is um, identity divided by two, the density matrix of this guy, the first spin, then we have this pair in an entangled state, so that's gonna look like a projector like this. And then for the last one we have again a reduced density matrix which is proportional to the identity, okay? I just quickly this uh, row the density matrix, reduced density matrix for region A, where this is spin one, spin two, three, and four, then this is for one, for two and three, and for spin four, okay? I hope this is clear. So, so then if we look at the entropy, entropy of row A, remember that um, we discussed briefly that the entropy is additive and the tensor product, so the entropy of this three objects is gonna be the sum of entropies. And so that's gonna be the entropy of identity divided by two, which is one. This is the one that we just discussed. Ident uh, entropy of a pure state, which is zero, plus entropy of this one, which is again one. And so if we add this, we get two, okay? And the rule is very simple. Whenever you see a drawing with singlets across and you want to know the entropy of region A, you just count how many singlets you're cutting, okay? We count how many singlets we're cutting, that's gonna give us the entropy. Is, is that clear? Okay, the entropy being additive, it just adds contributions from every single singlet you're cutting. Very good. So here's my toy model, okay? I'm going to assume that on each side, you have a lattice, a 1D lattice. I have a 1D lattice. And each side is described by two such spin one halves. On each side, instead of having one spin, I have two spins. No problem there. And then, so this, this denotes one side, the next one, and so on. And then I have that each spin in this pair of spins is entangled with spin in the next side, okay? So you see a collection of singlets here. And now I want to understand how much entropy we have in this, in this case. And so what I can do is I can consider region A to be like this. Okay, this is region A. And how much entropy do we have? Two, right? We are cutting two singlets. Okay, so the entropy for region A is two. Now, I'm gonna consider a larger region A. Okay, so let's call this A prime. And I'm gonna ask you how much entropy we have in A prime. How much? Very good, so two sounds like a constant if it happens twice. Uh, this two really is one plus one, meaning adding a contribution from the right boundary and from the left boundary. And what's happening here is that as we consider a larger and larger interval region A, the entropy is only coming from the boundary, right? And the boundary is not changing. We are changing the, the bulk, but not the boundary, okay? Okay, so we conclude that with this toy model, that indeed entropy as a function of L is going to be a constant, and in this time model this constant is equal to two, and it's just reflecting the fact that we have only short range entanglement, okay, entanglement between only nearest neighbors, and so it doesn't matter how large the region is, the entropy is only coming from the boundary, okay? Sorry. Okay. 
Very good. So what happens next is that we are done with the toy model in one dimension, but this is already reproducing the area law, which is what we had for gap systems. And you can think gap systems, show range entanglement, that makes sense. So that might be a very clear intuitive picture of what's happening in the ground state of a gap system in one dimension. And now this says turn page. Yeah. Now I'm gonna delete all this mess here. What if the boundary cuts a side? Yeah. You don't want to cut a side. Poor side. Uh, <laughs> OK, so you, you could, you know, the, the important thing is that this is not growing with L. So if it fluctuates a little bit, uh, we don't care. It's not that it's constant. It's that it's not scaling. OK, so it's upper bounded by a constant if you want. Yes. Um, how do you get this? Are you asking whether this is the ground state of a Hamiltonian that is local? Yeah. Actually, you could build some Hamiltonian that for a local Hamiltonian for, for which this would be the ground state. But like, you see that the gap, what is it? gap system should, have, uh, should follow the area law. Like we have to convince ourselves that gap system would have this kind of entanglement structure. Yes, this is a toy model. Yeah. So it's an oversimplified model. Right? But you already got some intuition from it. And that's all I want, that you get some intuition. That indeed, if, so what we've seen here is this model leads to a constant entanglement. Right? And now I'm just going to say, argue that, well, this is because it's short range. So when you have short range entanglement, the contributions that you have to count come directly from near the boundary. Right? And that I, I'm just going to claim that this happens whenever you have a gap. Uh, in, that this happens in the ground state of a gap Hamiltonian. Is that a general argument why a gap Hamiltonian would have short range entanglement? Um, you can build counterexamples, so I'm not going to say yes. Right? But generically, that's what we see. And if you want, if you think that there is some effective field theory describing that, then you would think that there is the massive, is a field theory for massive, massive particles, so things cannot go far away. Right, there is a decay attached to this mass. Isn't there a general result that says that every gap Hamiltonian has exponentially decaying correlation points? There is no general, again, you can always try to build counterexamples, but under certain assumptions, then yes, you can prove that there is some, ex under some assumptions. Some reasonable assumptions. Yeah, if you ask me, they are reasonable. <laughs> reasonable and convenient. Okay, so, so, Let's, let's jump to two dimensions, okay? Let's see that the same picture also, I mean, come on, I spent a lot of time drawing this, so let me explain it. Uh, that the same picture, we have something similar there. So this time, I ask you to consider sites with four spins on each side, okay? It's a toy model, don't panic. And then we have nearest neighbor entanglement between one spin here and one spin there, and so on, okay? And now, what you can do is, again, you can consider region Side, region A, okay? And we are going to count how many bonds we have to break. And what you realize is that how many bonds you have to break is proportional to the size of the boundary of region A, okay? So in this case, we find for region A, we count them, entropy of A is going to be two per side. So there are four sides here, and each one contributes two, okay? So that's equal to eight, very good. If we consider a larger region, say this region now, okay? So I'm gonna call this new region A prime. So the entropy of region A prime is equal to four times, because we have four sides here, times, and now one, two, three, okay? So we get some other number. What's important here is not the number, but how it scales. So if we had L time in a region that would be L times L, right, what we'll have is four times L, okay? And that's, that's what we wanted. So we've seen that the entropy 
in d equal to 2 of this time model, of this time model, goes as is proportional to the size of the boundary of the region. Okay? So area law. Okay, that's what we call the area law. And why? Well, again, I'll argue that all the contributions come from spins that are very close to the boundary because we only have short range entanglement. So again, short range entanglement implies this area law. All right? And then, um, and then we could do the same in three dimensions. And so you could build some guy like this, right? Each side now has C six um, spins, and they are entangled with ne ne neighboring spins. And then you'll get, again, that you, know, you have a region that is L times L times L, right? You're going to have some of these guys coming out. So there will be, you'll be cutting a number of bonds which will be here, you'll get L times L, so L squared contributions, and then there will be six phases. And so this is going to be, again, um, S of L in D equal to 3. Okay, It's going to be L to the D minus 1 again. Okay, For the same reason. Very good. So conclusion, short range entanglement implies the boundary law. All right, but we want to get also logarithms. Um, and I'm so glad I already drew this in advance. So now we need to change the toy model. So I want to have another toy model. So um, now I want to talk about logarithmic corrections. And I'll start with d equal to 1 in one dimension. So now what I want you to think about is the possibility that um, we have not just short range singlets, but also longer range singlets. And in particular, um, we have short range singlets between nearest neighbors everywhere. I'm just going to draw them near the boundary. So this side here is a very complicated object, which has many spins. And I'm not going to even specify how it works. But assume that in particular, there is a nearest neighbor entanglement here. Okay, nearest neighbor singlet between some degrees of freedom on this side and on this that side. But also, if I now look at the system from, if, if I consider pairs of of sides here, and a pair of sides there, two sides together, there is also some factorization of the vector space here, such that we get a singlet state entangled. So, at uh, yeah, some some degrees of freedom in here entangled with the degrees of freedom in there, right? And the same thing here. Okay. And this happens also when we put together four spins inside and outside, we get a new contribution and also another contribution. Okay. So this time model is a bit more esoteric. I didn't explain exactly who is entangled with whom, but you can imagine that there are plenty of degrees of freedom in this Hilbert space for these two sides and this two sides, and that there is some entanglement between the two. So what we see here is that we have some, uh, if we had some form of a scale invariance, then we would be saying that um, all length scales contribute to entanglement entropy to entanglement entropy okay and now it's just like, um, is that picture you know it cannot it cannot be very clear but is it kind of clear that what I'm saying is that we go beyond the simple case where we only have nearest neighbor entanglement now we consider also entanglement at longer distances yes so um, why exactly do we go from one to two to four and so on to three um, I want to consider some form of renormalization group transformation in which I rescale space by a constant factor, two, and I want to do this several times. That's that's why. Okay. Okay. So let's let's look at this. So what we have here is that our region A has size eight, and we have as before that we just count contributions from the boundary. So we we get. Um, 
we get the contribution that is equal to some number. Let me see. How do I want to explain this? Right, so, so, for, so what we got is the total entanglement entropy is equal to two. This two comes from how many boundaries we have in a segment in 1D. But then we have different contributions, okay? We get, in this case, one from this level, one from this level, and one from that level, okay? So we, we got three different contributions from different length scales. Okay, if we had started with L equal to four, then the entropy in this case would have gone, been equal to two times how many different length scales can contribute. Okay, but in this case, we would see that there are only two different length scales because you see here we have to stop. If we constrain this into a single side, right? The next contribution actually is entanglement that already goes across the system. So we had to stop. The size L of, the, of our region A is giving, up, is giving the largest length scale at which we will get the contribution from entanglement. So in this case, we would only get two contributions. Okay? If we had, in general, L equal to 2 to the n, then the entropy would be 2, it's coming from the two boundaries, times, and then contributions from all the length scales. In this case, we would have n different contributions, okay? n different contributions. And so this automatically gives us the 2 log 2, well, I mean, I would say 2n, which is 2 log 2 L, okay? That's how we get the logarithmic corrections. We have that the entanglement entropy between a region and the rest of the system is the sum of different contributions, each contribution coming from a different length scale. Okay, so I want to repeat this in two dimensions. Pedro, if you want to start using the blackboard. <laughs> so I want to repeat this intuition in two dimensions. And in two dimensions, I'm just going to say the same, right? So I have, now we are in B equal to 2, and I'm going to consider a system of size L, in this case, A times A. And now what I see is that Effectively, I can consider that I'm considering this, and I'm going to count how many contributions to entanglement I get. But we know this. This one we know, right? How many? So the entropy here is going to be entropy. The, en the total entropy is going to have a contribution from here, which we, we know from before. We have 8 times 4, right? 4 times 8. 4 is the size, is how many faces we have. Okay? And 8 is the size um, L. Okay? So this is a contribution that we get from this, the shortest length scale. But now we can ask, OK, what if we also had contributions from longer length, length scales? So in this case, you know, if we cross-grain four sides into one here, right, then what we see is that the, effectively, this now consists of only four effective sides. The length has been reduced. So now we, the contribution is going to be four, one, two, three, four, times four. Okay? And here, it's going to be four times two. Okay, so now we're going to sum all these numbers, and what we see is that when we add them together, this is four times uh, eight plus four plus two. But I could also write it in terms of four times eight, which was the original, the original length of the boundary, and then factor one plus one half plus one fourth. Okay, and in general, if you do this starting from a generic L, or L to the N, or whatever you want to consider, what you see is that you have 4 times L, okay, the entropy goes as 4 times L, and then you add contributions from all the length scales again. The first one comes with the 1, because you really have as many singlets as, as the linear size. But the second one, you have an effective number of sides which has been divided by 2, and the next one has been divided by 4, and so on, okay? And I don't even need to know how many terms, I mean, he in general have log two L terms, but the important thing is that they are not the same. And actually, if you add these guys together, you realize that this is always smaller than two, okay? So this is upper bounded by two, coming from here, times four L, okay? And this is proportional to L. 
So what we see is that if we try to repeat the trick that we saw for this scale invariance trick in two dimensions, the entropy does not show a logarithmic correction. It's still area law. OK? But that, also, that, that should sound familiar, because what we saw here is for the gapless case is that if we have a small Fermi surface, okay, then there is no correction, logarithmic correction to the area law. So um, is that clear? Yeah. Okay, I'm counting contributions coming from different length scales, but this time the contributions from different length scales are suppressed because the effective um, uh, boundary of these regions is shrinking. So we get that the whole sum is dominated by the first term already. OK? OK. So now what we would like to see, finally, is whether with the same type of toy model or a similar a variation of the toy model, we can get the logarithmic correction. And the answer will be yes. And that's what we have here. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume something weird. I'm going to assume that you know, there was some form of RG transformation going on there when I was changing the scale by a factor two. So I'm going to assume that there is, a, for some reason, when I coarse grain my system, I get two effective copies of the coarse grain system. Okay? So instead of getting just one copy, I get two at a different length scale. In, in, in other words, the contributions from the next length scale come, is doubled. Okay? There are more, there, it's as if the system had two copies. And then every time I coarse grain, I get this kind of situation where um, each copy of my system produces two new copies. And actually, this is something, some crazy idea that came out of trying to match this logarithmic correction. But then you can go to systems and see that something like that happens, and we'll see this next week. In any case, when we do the counting now, what do we have? What do we have? So first, we have um, and contribution from this, the smallest length scale is four, because we have, again, four contributions times uh, L, the size, the linear size, and one copy. So now we're going to put here copies, how many copies we have. Okay? So this is, um, uh, and this is the length, effective length, effective size of boundary, size of boundary. And so in the next level, what we have is four times L over two, right? Because effectively, this length has been shrink divided by two. We have four contributions. So we have four times two. But now we have two copies, OK, for some strange reason. And we go down here and we have four times one uh, L over four. What I'm saying is that each copy now is contributing um, this L Effective length has been divided by a factor of four. Okay? But now we have four copies. So now I think I can do this 4L, 4L, 4L. So the total entropy now is 4L times 1 plus 1 plus 1. And this, this goes on for as many length scale as we want. Okay? So this gives us. 4L log L, and this is the logarithmic correction. Question? Yeah, what I really wonder about this is how these two different renormalization group procedures follow from the fact that the Fermi surface is small or large. These are very good questions, and I'm not going to be able to answer them okay. today. Um, next week, I'll say uh, the same thing. <laughs> 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 but you know, let's wait there. Um, but what we're trying to build here is some intuition, right? And the intuition is that the logarithmic correction in more than one dimension, so two dimensions, three dimensions, comes from the fact that something weird happens as we change scale. And this something weird, by something weird, I mean is, is it, yeah, I mean that we get something like more copies of our system. OK? Is this used anywhere else in our systems? Like that, like you, you've never seen this before. OK, good. Yes, uh, no, there are papers about this. I'm, I didn't make it up for this no, lecture. No, I mean, like, like, for example, like if I do RG flows in QFT, like, can I suddenly get like, these copies of my system? Or? Um, QFT, if you work with the system with a Fermi surface, 
Um, there is actually, this relates to holography. There, there is some holographic description where you will see an extra dimension that corresponds in, in the holographic direction, which corresponds to the number of copies. It's a continuum of copies. So you, you can relate this to holography. But I'm not going to do this now because Pedro is waiting. Thanks, Pedro. Sorry. OK. Um, we, we'll continue tomorrow. So we, if, it would be good if you have questions. Maybe we, we can address them tomorrow at the beginning. Okay.